All right. And my name is Jennifer Venable. I am the Education Specialist with Loudoun Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we're part of Area 2 in this whole puzzle. So today you're going to be hearing from Michael Trope, who is, has been the Conservation Education Specialist at the John Marshall Soil and Water Conservation District, which covers Fakir, Fakir County. Sorry, I always have trouble saying that since 2013. Um, he received his BS degree in integrated science and technology from James Madison University. Go Dukes, me too. Um, and tech, and uh, also a MS in environmental studies from VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. So in his spare time, he enjoys hiking and relaxing outdoors. Um, so while uh, Mr. Trope presents today, I'll be taking, put any questions you can think of in the chat box. If it's relevant to the current topic, we'll, we'll pause Michael and ask the question right away, but otherwise we'll wait till the end for a Q&A session, okay? Um, all right, so uh, do, are you gonna be sharing your screen, Michael, I think? I probably will at some point. Okay. Um, the way, yeah, so the way, the way I had more structured this is more of a Q&A type deal. Um, so please start asking questions. Um, I do have a PowerPoint that I can present. I don't really want to. Um, I'd much rather sit here and answer all of your questions. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, feel free to either, you know, ask them in the chat box or if you're patient, we can try to unmute and you can ask them that way, um, whichever way you, you want to do. Um, I hope everyone saw the videos that I did. Um, I hope that was informative. If it wasn't, please let me know. If it was, please let me know. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I focused on topics of macroinvertebrates and watershed delineation, um, just as two sort of broad topics to look at, um, but we can certainly go beyond that. Um, if you guys clicked on the link that I posted in the description of that video, um, I feel like a YouTuber now. Um, <laughs> You, it took you to my website where I had several other resources. Um, we can go through some of those resources. I had some um, dichotomous keys. I had a sample test. Um, you know, we can go through that if you guys want. Um, let me know what you want to do. Otherwise, it's going to be a long hour. <laughs> yeah, I know from the beginning forestry <laughs> that I think a lot of people had not had the chance to see his PowerPoint. So he went ahead and, and stepped through that as a, as a starting point. Um, so if uh, we can wait a minute to see if someone has a burning question perhaps after, but um, it could be that some people hadn't had the chance yet to, to get familiar with all your cool resources, which are available online and everybody will be able to watch later on as well. Um, so. Yes, and I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and I'll throw the link into that, to that site into the chat box here. Um, Okay, and someone is requesting, could you please go over the PowerPoint? So, whenever you're ready. Hey, I, got, I, I have a, uh, this is Josh Flam from Cumberland High School. Um, me and my co coach are on here. Um, and we have not had opportunity to go over any of the material. We just recently got our team started. Um, and so I would certainly probably have a lot of burning questions. I just don't know that I know the questions to ask. So <laughs> anything that you have to offer. <laughs> Appreciate it. Understood. Yes. Okay. So we can start there. Start it the, at the beginning. <laughs> All right. Well, there's the uh, the link to the resources um, that I put on my website, um, and so you can go ahead and take a look at those. Um, but I'll go ahead and um, we'll go through a little bit of a PowerPoint here. Um, We'll sort of we'll jump around a little bit in this. Um, let me go ahead and I will start sharing my screen in just a minute once I figure this out. All right. So let's try this. Let's see if I can 
can I share my screen and have the chat window open at the same time so I can see? Well, Jennifer, you'll you'll monitor the chat window for me um, and just go ahead and interrupt me if, if there are questions. I sure will. Yep, I'm on it. So thank you. Your screen looks great. So take it away. OK, um, so we'll go ahead and we'll start with the water cycle. Um, so this is, you know, very sort of basic aquatic stuff. Um, you have you know, your major things, you have condensation, you have evaporation, precipitation, runoff. Um, but then you'll notice in this diagram that I've got here, there are a lot of other um, things to consider. Um, so things like, you know, groundwater flow uh, and infiltration. You have water that soaks into the ground and uh, can be taken up at that, that point by plants or can you know, continue to flow underground for a while. Some of that might come up in a spring or feed freshwater lakes and streams and rivers. Um, and then some of it, you know, might make it out to the ocean um, where it might evaporate and continue through its, its cycle. Uh, other things, you have um, less common things like sublimation and desublimation, which is where you have water going directly from a, um, a solid to a gas without going through the liquid phase and then vice versa, a gas to a solid without going through the liquid phase. Um, and then you have evapotranspiration, which is evaporation and, and transpiration from plants. Um, <clears throat> so that's the simple water cycle um, that we've got there. Uh, in my video, I talked a little bit about water monitoring, um, so we can go through and, and talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> some monitoring. So there are a couple different types of, of water monitoring that we can do on our streams. Um, you have actually really a third type in here, but you've got chemical, biological, and then you've got physical. Um, so the physical would be measuring things like what's the width of the stream, uh, how deep is it? Um, what's the flow rate, things like that. Um, whereas the chemical, uh, as you can read here, are going to be things like measuring the pH of the stream, the, the acidity of the stream, uh, the dissolved oxygen levels, uh, what types of nutrients are in there, any toxic metals, any, anything like that. Um, and then the biological aspect of it is looking at living organisms. So you're looking at plants, you're looking at um, fish, um, crustaceans, insects, all those sorts of things. Um, and the probably the most common one that we look at is uh, macroinvertebrates. Um, so we, we tend to focus on macroinvertebrates because, well, a couple of reasons. One, they're good indicators of water quality. Um, so I'll talk about it in a minute. They have different tolerances to pollution. Um, but also they're pretty commonly found and they're easy to catch. Um, fish are a little more difficult um, to, to, to catch and to use to, you know, figure out the water quality. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when we look at the differences between the sort of the chemical, chemical and biological aspects, um, think of it like chemical is like taking a, a picture or a snapshot of the water at that time. Um, whereas biological measurements are more of taking a, a video recording. So if I go out to a stream and I measure the pH, um, I'm, I'm measuring the pH at that exact moment. Um, I don't know what it was five minutes earlier. I don't know what it'll be five minutes later. I know what is it is at that exact moment. If I take that sample and then a plume of some pollutant comes down um, down river and passes my area with the pH of say three, um, whereas normally you're gonna have you know five or six for the pH, if the pH of three comes through there um, and then you know continues flowing downstream and that takes you know 20 minutes for that plume to go through and then you know 30 minutes later I come in and I test the pH again and it's you know six or, or you know, at that range, I'm not even going to know that that came through. So I have two different snapshots. They both show the same thing, but they don't show what happened in the middle. Whereas biological measurements, I might find, you know, if I, if I sample right before 
uh, that plume came through, I might find, you know, a lot of um, macroinvertebrates that need uh, clean, really clean water, good, healthy stream. And afterwards, I might find that a lot of those are sort of struggling to live. Um, and so that's sort of the difference between the um, snapshot and the video. So with the macroinvertebrates, the biological monitoring, I've, because the, the macros were in there for the whole length of time, I've been able to capture what happened to them. So <laughs> macroinvertebrates are animals that do not have backbones and they are large enough to be seen without, um, <clears throat> without the use of microscopes or magnifying glasses or, or things like that. So insects, worms, clams, crayfish, leeches, snails, um, these are examples of um, macroinvertebrates. Um, <clears throat> Do they die immediately or move downstream is a, a question in the chat box. Um, it, it sort of depends on how severe the pollution is. If it's you know extremely severe, extremely toxic, they could die instantly. But if you have a, a plume of something that has just a you know a low pH moving through, um, you know, there's and there's you know not other stuff associated with it, they're probably gonna be okay. Um, you might have some of the more sensitive ones dying um, relatively quickly, uh, depending on the duration of it. Um, they typically won't move downstream, though. Um, they, they're sort of, while, while they are mobile, they can't really move outside of their, you know, general you know, range of, you know, maybe, I don't know the exact range, but it's not going to be very far. Um, not going to be more than several hundred feet. Um, There's another question. I don't know if you see it. I can certainly be asking so you don't have to worry, but um, what kind sure. of probe do you all use for pH tests? Um, so you can use, you can use, there, there are many different ways to test pH. Um, so you can use their little strips, um, litmus paper that will change color. It's just, a, that's all it is, a little strip of paper. It'll change color. You stick it in the water, it'll change color based on the pH of the water. Um, that's sort of the basic, the most simple, and the least accurate. And you can go from there up to, you know, specific probes that can cost thousands of dollars, um, where you can, you know, stick it in the water and measure, or you can mount it constantly in the water and set it to take measurements, you know, every every 15 minutes or something like that. Um, that was one of the, the things that I did. Um, some of my research on in, in school was using data that was collected from a, a monitoring station where it had 15 minute inter in intervals. Um, it would take a, a data point every 15 minutes. Um, and so that those are the sort of the, the two wide ranges of, of pH. You've got the really expensive probes and the easy paper. Um, most of the ones that I use uh, tend to be um, like little kits. Um, so they're not quite as basic as just the paper, you know, it involves some chemicals, you, you, like a, a Lamotte kit is an example. Um, there are other kinds too, Chemetrics and, and other sorts of you know, name kits, um, like you might find for a, a, a to test the water in a pool. Um, very similar type, type kit to that, you fill it up with water, you add a couple drops of indicator solution, you shake it until it changes color. Um, that's probably the most common type of kit that you'll see used. Good questions. Um, all right, back to macroinvertebrates. So, as I said, some macroinvertebrates are more tolerant of pollution than others. So we can take a whole sample of macroinvertebrates and we can look at, um, you know, how many of the, in the sort of tolerant uh, category we find, how many in the intolerant category, and how many in the somewhat tolerant category. So intolerant ones would be ones that are pollution sensitive. Uh, so these would be examples like mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, um, and aquatic beetles can sort of fall into that category. They're sort of in between somewhat tolerant and, and intolerant. Um, <clears throat> but you're going to find um, these, these are going to be really good indicators, um, and they're often used by fly fishermen because this is what um, things like trout need. 
need to eat, or they, they like to eat these things um, because they're found in nice clean water and trout need nice clean water to survive. Um, so you, fly fishermen are often um, found uh, familiar with these in, insects. Uh, somewhat tolerant ones are going to be things like crayfish, scuds, sow bugs, dragonflies, damselflies. Um, so they can take a little bit more pollution, um, but if it gets too much, they're, they're not going to do too well. So just because they can handle some pollution doesn't mean you won't find them in clean water as well. You, you can absolutely find them in clean water. Um, and in fact, that's one thing that we look for is you know, in, in a, a clean water stream, we look for the diversity. Um, you know, are we finding the mayflies and the stoneflies, but are we also finding more tolerant organisms as well? We like to see a nice wide diversity of, of organisms. Um, and then so the tolerant ones we also like to see. So these can live in more polluted water as well. Um, so worms, leeches, uh, certain types of snails. So there are two types of snails that you sort of need to um, figure out. And these are in the, um, you can see these on the ID key that I um, posted in the link that I sent to you guys. Um, <clears throat> so there's a gilled snail and a lung snail. Um, and you identify them based on which direction. So if you hold the, the shell up um, with the, the point facing upwards, um, and you look at where the opening is, if the opening is on the left side, it's a lung snail, and those are tolerant of pollution. Uh, if it's on the right side, they're a gilled snail, and they are intolerant of pollution. So um, good to know the differences between those. Okay. Um, I think I saw another question come in. Um, what would the virtual questions look like? Uh, this is so hands. Yeah, so this is the this is the problem with the virtual aspect of, of doing this. Um, you don't get the fun hands-off stuff, unfortunately. Um, it's probably going to be, um, at least with the macroinvertebrates, it's going to be more identifying. Um, so figuring out, you know, what, I, being able to identify a picture, not as exciting as identifying the actual bug. Um, or, or things similar to that. Um, there'll also be, you know, some multiple choice questions and uh, matching things like that um, is sort of how I'll probably work up the test. Um, but yeah, the the hands-on aspect and is is unfortunately not going to be able to be done this year, which is a shame. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the method that we use is called the um, Modified Virginia Save Our Streams method. Um, and it has been you know, sort of found to be, we'll call it adequate. Um, so they've, they've studied this scientifically. And the, the real way you identify or you, you look at macroinvertebrates is you collect all of them in the net and then you take them back to a lab and you very carefully identify them down to genus and species level. Um, the Virginia modified Save Our Streams method uh, doesn't do this. It looks more at the order and um, family level. So if you remember your, your hierarchy, they have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, so we're looking at more of the, the order and the, the family level there that we're identifying down to. And it's, found, it's been found to be adequate for, you know, sort of um, figuring out the general idea of how clean a stream is. So we go out to a stream um, and we look for a riffle area. Riffle area is an area um, that has uh, sort of like a little whitewater area. So if you see in the in the background here, um, you see the sort of white water there. Um, that's sort of what we're, we're talking about. Um, and it's, it's really good habitat for macroinvertebrates. They like to hang out there because there's a lot of oxygen in the water at that point. Um, so the water is cascading over the rocks and 
it's oxygen is getting added and it's it's really good habitat for them, especially the sensitive species. Um, and we do this typically on a, a quarterly basis. Um, so we go out to the stream and we put a net down. It's about three feet by three feet. Um, we stick that into the substrate and we can sometimes use a, a couple of rocks to hold the bottom down. And then we rub the rocks on the bottom. Um, so we pick them up, we, we rub all over them. Um, we try to dislodge any macroinvertebrates that are attached to them um, because then they will you know, be released from the rock and flow into the net. Um, we do this for you know, 20 to 30 seconds, you know, get your foot down in the, in the substrate and use it to, to kick up some more stuff. Um, and then um, take it back to the uh, stream side and then you pick through the net to look at the different macroinvertebrates that you find there. Um, we use ice cube trays to sort. That's a you know, really easy way to uh, compartmentalize you know, the different um, types that you're looking at um, and sort of separate them out and you know, also keep some of the bigger ones from eating some of the smaller ones if, if you can. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, let's see. So counting the sample. Um, for the Virginia Saver Streams method, we need at least 200 different species, or not species, specimens, uh, 200 different macroinvertebrates, um, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not. Um, this is often done in one net. Um, you know, probably, you know, when I go out, probably 90 to 95% of the time, I can find 200 organisms in a net. Um, you have to, you know, it, it takes a while to sit there and pick through them all, but you can find it without problem. Um, sometimes it may take three or four samples, though, if, if they're, you pick a, you know, bad ripple multiple times um, that doesn't have a whole lot or um, something like that, you know, it may take several nettings to get to that number. Um, <clears throat> so you're counting everything that's in the net. Um, you know, 200 is, is the minimum that you need, but you have to count everything that you find in the net. Um, luck, you know, if, if you're lucky, you'll get, you know, just over 200. If you're um, really unlucky, like I've been sometimes, um, you'll sit there with several people counting for multiple hours because you got so many in your net um, that it's just, it's crazy. I think the most I've gotten is um, like 14 or 1600, something, you know, crazy like that. Um, and it took a, a long time to get through. Okay, so you can record the results on tally sheets like this. Um, and then for the Virginia Saver Streams method, it's got a score from zero to 12. Uh, zero to seven is considered unacceptable. Eight is sort of a, a gray zone, you know, could be good, could be bad. And then nine to 12 is in the acceptable zone. Um, and, you know, there are different metrics that you can use as well. So there are different ways of sort of calculating the score. Um, this is what we use. Um, after using it for several years, I, you know, I think there are probably some better ones out there, but this is, you know, sufficient, um, I think. Um, you know, there, there are definitely some flaws with this one, but, um, you know, overall, you have to figure out what works the best for you. And I think this works, you know, this works fine. It gives us the results that we need, and I think they're accurate. Um, so the changes in the water quality over time um, is what these data can show. So if you go out and you monitor, you know, year after year, you can hopefully see improvements in the water quality, or you may be seeing decreases in the water quality. Um, but of course, we always hope for the improvements. Um, so you can see, you can use it to measure um, pollution control practices. So um, what my office does is we administer the uh, Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program. So we work with landowners, farmers mainly to do things, put in practices like uh, fencing animals out of streams and putting um, cover crops on the land in the winter um, and, and things like that. Um, and so what we'll do is occasionally if we've got a, a landowner who's really, you know, cooperative and, and really wants to work with us, um, we will have them 
uh, allow us, they'll, you know, they'll allow us to go out and monitor um, at certain periods of time for these macroinvertebrates. So we'll monitor, we'll try to monitor before they put in the best management practice, you know, before they fence the animals out of the stream and then after. Um, and so we see, you know, what has changed. And we've actually gotten some good data from this. Um, we've seen scores go, um, there's one, one place here in, in Fauquier County that I can think of where we saw a score go from um, about a five, um, so unacceptable, um, up to a, a nine uh, being acceptable um, in, I think it was a little over a year um, before and, and after they put in, in that practice. Um, what do you, the question is, what do you do with the metrics after you have them? Um, yeah, so um, specifically, you know, what we do with the metrics is, you know, we use them for, for this, this sort of thing, um, but we also send them to the state. Um, so we upload our data to a database, which then the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality looks at, and they can use that data to um, to sort of, they can't use it for like listing streams as impaired or as you know not impaired, um, but they can use it to figure out their monitoring strategy. Um, so if there's a stream that's you know that they have that they have listed as impaired, and you know we go out and we're monitoring constantly, and our data you know over a couple of years shows that it's you know appears to be no longer impaired they'll send their scientists out and to confirm that uh, data. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's another thing that can be used, uh, that can be done with the data. Michael? Yes. Can I ask a question? Because I'm sure. learning too. So this data, what, what would DEQ do with like a severely impaired stream, for example? Good question. So they can go and um, if, if it's, you know, impaired, they can write what's called a TMDL, a total maximum daily load, um, which is a effectively a pollution diet. Um, so they look at, you know, um, what are the sources of pollution and, you know, they, they come up with a strategy on how they can deal with those sources of pollution uh, in that specific watershed. And then they, you know, uh, try to implement those practices or solutions to try to reduce the pollution. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's 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 the sort of the main thing that they try to do. Um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about macroinvertebrates, most of these organisms um, start their lives in the water. Um, so you know, I talked. You heard me mention like mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies. Okay, so the name fly is common. Um, so these are flies, um, but they start their lives in the water, and they live in the water for you know potentially several years, uh, and then they will crawl out, go through metamorphosis, and become like a fly that you'd see flying around. Um, they then mate, lay their eggs, and then die. Um, and that's that's pretty much their life life cycle, um, but they go through the metamorphosis stage when they go from the aquatic organism to the adult organism. Um, so there are two types of metamorphosis: there is incomplete metamorphosis and there is complete metamorphosis. So in incomplete metamorphosis, you've got three stages: you've got an egg stage, you've got a nymph stage, and you've got an adult stage. Um, so in incomplete metamorphosis, you've got uh, the nymph stage, which um, you've got a, basically it's, it looks like the adult, um, but it's smaller, it doesn't have wings, um, and it, it, that sort of thing. Um, whereas in the complete metamorphosis, you've got uh, another stage in there, you go from the egg stage to the larval stage, to the pupa stage, to the adult stage. Um, so think of this as like a, a butterfly type. Uh, organism. Um, you know, it, it starts off at the egg and then it has the larva, which would be in the butterfly analogy, this would be the caterpillar. And then you've got the pupa. Um, so that's when they start to sort of make their cocoon. And then you've got the, the adult stage. Um, I think I saw a question come in. 
students have to do fish ID or mostly macros. Um, <laughs> macros are more common. They might have to do some fish. Um, if they do, if it's fish ID, it's probably going to be more of the um, more common fish. Um, so things like um, smallmouth bass, uh, largemouth bass, uh, shad, um, uh, sturgeon, uh, American eel, brook trout, um, some of the, the more common things. You know, you're not going to have to um, identify, um, you know, a, a rosy sided dace or other, you know, small minnows or, or things like that. Um, so it's, it's going to be mainly the, you know, the sort of major uh, fish that you, you might have to identify. But yeah, that, that could be something that you're asked on a, on a test. Uh, and then are the cocoons in the water too? It was an aquatic example. Um, so yeah, so um, the cocoons, their, their pupa stage, they are in the water for their pupa stage. Um, one I can think of is a, uh, um, the common net spinner um, that has a pupa stage um, where it sort of, it looks like a, oh, I don't know how to describe it. Um, it looks like, if you know what a net spinner looks like, it looks sort of like halfway in between a, a net spinner and the, you know, an adult fly. Um, it's sort of, you know, that's, I don't know how to describe it really. Um, if you look up like net spinner pupa, um, you can, you can see what it looks like. Um, but I don't really know how to describe it. Another one of those, um, what's another one? Um, that's the main one that I can think of. There, yeah, that's, that's the main one. Um, there are a lot more of the um, incomplete metamorphosis ones than the complete metamorphosis ones. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute here. And let's see. Um, let me jump around to my slideshow here a little bit. Um, if you have any more, you know, macro and vertebrate questions, you know, feel free to, to ask them. We, we can, we can answer them uh, and talk about them. But I want to jump over to um, watersheds. Um, real quick here. Um, so we talked some about watersheds. Um, so hopefully you guys know what a watershed is. Um, if you don't, uh, it is a, um, it's a area of land. Okay, so it's, it's the land area that drains to a specific water body. So we're not talking about a, um, you know, a, a water body here, we're talking about the actual land itself that's draining um, to the water body. Um, oftentimes watersheds are named after water bodies though, and that's sort of where the confusion can come from. Um, so here is a map of uh, the watersheds of Virginia. Um, and if you guys want in the chat, if you want to try to identify uh, some of these watersheds, if you, you know, just, um, list the color um, and then what watershed it is. Uh, if you want to try to do that, here's a, I'll give you guys a, a key to work from here. Okay, so the, the Chesapeake Bay, so the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed is a watershed. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really large watershed that encompasses six different states. Uh, plus the District of Columbia. So it's it's uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York. Um, parts of those states drained into the Chesapeake Bay. And actually, um, the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, if I can draw in here again, um, actually is everything basically above this red line that I'm drawing here. Um, so everything above that is going to go into the Chesapeake Bay. So that's this is the Chesapeake Bay over here. Um, and everything above that line is going to go into the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. So the darkest gray 
is the James. Yes. Yeah, so that's the um, uh, it's coming up more of a sort of a brown color on my um, screen here. But yes, it's the James. The lightest blue, the Roanoke. Um, <clears throat> So it's not really blue. Um, the, the, the really blue one is not the, um, the Roanoke one. Um, the light gray is the Potomac Shenandoah, yeah. Yellow is the York, yes. Um, the, uh, so I'm using the, um, annotation feature. I don't know if you guys have that feature, um, available. Um, but I do as a presenter, at least I can, might as well, actually. Um, let's see the purple is the Olson. Uh, yes. Light gray is the Roanoke. Yes, this this is the Roanoke. Sort of the, the light gray there. Um, I'm going to change my change my text color. Let's change the text color a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Green is the Chesapeake Bay Coastal. Yep. The green or the beige is a big sandy. Yes, one of those is the big sandy, um, and it's the it's the green one. Yep, that's the the big sandy there. The blue is the new. Yes. Mm -hmm. Morals blue or red in the bottom right. Okay, so this is the the red is the owl moral. Mm -hmm. Far right gray is Atlantic. Yep, yeah. Atlantic, not Atlanta. Um, What else do we have? So we've got, so we've got this sort of lightish purplish one down here between the Albemarle Sound and the Roanoke. Um, we've got the beige one here, and we've got this light blue one here, okay, uh, and the orange one. So the orange is the Yadkin, uh huh. Light green, yeah. So this light bluish green is the Rappahannock. There. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just got two left, I think. So the big sandy is the green there. Holston is the purple. So we've got, let's see, what do we have left? So we've got uh, the Chowan and the Clinch Powell are the only two that are left. Um, the light yellow is not the Chowan. 
So that should, there you go. Yep. Yeah. The clinch pal, which leaves the Chuan, this one, yes. All right. So that's the, um, those are the watersheds of Virginia. Um, and I can, I can, um, yeah, I tell you what I'll do is I will, um, I will throw this. So I've got the, the key here um, for it, which tells you, you know, which, which color is which, which one. Um, I can throw this up um, on that site um, that, I, that I shared with you at the beginning. Um, I can do that. I'll do that after, after we finish here. Um, I'll throw that up there. Um, okay, so I am going to, again, stop sharing and jump around in the slideshow again. Um, so let's talk a little bit about wetlands. Um, so wetlands are really important um, for many different reasons. Um, they are uh, really good habitat for organisms. They are good um, flood control. Um, you know, they, they can absorb a lot of water. They are really good filters, so they can filter out nutrients. Um, they're good or important stopover flights for migratory birds. Um, so birds that might be coming from, uh, flying from, you know, like South and Central America in the, uh, to flying to Canada in the summer, um, and then back home in the winter, they you know, will stop often in wetlands um, because there's usually abundant food, um, nice places to hide. Uh, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> they are, as I said, they're good filters, good for uh, flood control. Um, <clears throat> they are just really important um, parts of the ecosystem. Um, often they're called the kidneys of the ecosystem um, because they are really, really fantastic at filtering things. Um, unfortunately, wetlands have been on the decline over the past several hundred years. Um, let me share again. All right. um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> hopefully y'all can see that again. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a map of wetland losses in the United States. Um, it's a little, little outdated, but not a whole lot has changed since the 1980s. Um, so you see there's some places that have lost between 80 and 100% of their wetlands, um, and others that are doing pretty well have only lost between zero and 20% and of their wetlands. Um, this is a sort of general map of um, the wetlands in the United States. Um, so you can see a lot of coastal wetlands, and then there are a lot of wetlands along streams and near lakes and another sort of uh, similar habitat like that. Um, Alaska and Hawaii on, aren't on here. Um, Hawaii's got some. Alaska is like one giant wetland, um, especially the, the more northern parts. Um, there's a lot of wetland uh, up there. Okay, so as I said, you know, wetlands haven't lost a whole lot of area in the past you know, 30 years or so, or 40 years, 50 years, whatever. Um, <clears throat> there were some laws put in place in the 70s and 80s to try to reduce the loss of wetland. Um, and you can see that's happened. So in the 50s, 70s, um, you had 458,000, um, I guess these are acres, um, must be, yeah, acres, it says, um, of wetland lost, whereas in the, 50, at the 80s to the 90s, you only had 58,000 uh, acres lost. Um, 
so you know we've we've really reduced that once we've you know since we've learned more about them and have a better understanding of um, you know all their all their really good benefits. Um, and actually, there is a policy now of no net loss. So you can get permits to you know destroy wetlands and and you know pave over them um, these days, but you have to replace those wetlands. Um, somewhere else, um, and you know, it, it's debatable whether that, that not that's a solid policy, um, but that's that's currently the the policy. So no net loss um, of of wetlands. Did you see in the chat the um, question? What does conterminous mean? Terminus. Um, <clears throat> I think that's maybe a misspelling of contiguous. I'm not sure. Um, the point of it, though, is uh, wetland losses have um, declined, um, which is it's just a good thing. Okay, so um, wetlands are basically what they sound like. They are sort of the intermediary between the dry land, which we all live on, and the water, uh, and you know, the, the aquatic land. Um, so that's the easy definition. Um, actually delineating or, or you know, specifying wetlands is um, um, a little more tricky um, to try to define you know, where they are. Um, I saw another. Okay, sharing common boundary. Okay. Um, thank you for that definition. Then. I, I learned something new. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> for know sure. what, that, what that meant then. Okay. Um, that's good to know. Um, so, how we define or delineate. Um, wetlands. So there are three characteristics uh, that make up wetlands. You've got um, hydrology, hydric soils, and plants. So hydrology is water. So wetlands have to be wet. Um, pretty simple there. Um, this is one definition. Um, lands that are inundated or saturated within 18 inches of the soil surface for more than seven consecutive days during the grown season. Um, there is, so this is one specific criteria. There are many, many, many different criteria um, to look at, you know, whether there is a, what we call a hydrologic regime going on there. Um, so it may be there is, you know, um, you know water higher on at certain periods, um, um, or there's, you know, it may not be within 18 inches of the soil surface, but um, it's there for a longer period of time. Um, so there are the, the the actual manual to delineate wetlands is about this thick, um, and it goes through all the different, you know, criteria. So you can have, you know, a combination of this. Or you can have, you know, A plus B can equal, you know, wetland hydrologic regime, or you know, A plus D plus H can be, you know, a hydrologic regime. So there are many um, different definitions. Just understand that there has to be a sort of water regime. There has to be um, water there in some form, usually during the growing season. <laughs> then you have hydric soils. So soils um, which um, are basically they have uh, had been saturated in water. Um, and you'll get this sort of, uh, if you see down in the, um, on the, uh, well, yeah, down the bottom there, I guess all three are more of a um, blade soil, but it, it's really apparent in the, um, in the bottom right hand one. Um, it's got that gray color. Um, and we call that glade soils and that's I'll put in the chat G L E Y. What did I do? 
clayed soils is what we're we're talking about. Um, that's that's the term for that grayish color, um, and that's highly indicative of um, of wetland soils. Um, we use a uh, soil book, basically a, a color book, um, which you guys will talk about in, in soils probably um, in the soil section today um, to determine um, that grayish color if it's if it's a wetland soil or not. Um, other times you might see um, it's uh, called modeling, M-O-T-T-L-I-N-G, um, where the it's got uh, sort of like uh, little tentacles um, of different colors in the in the soil. Um, so you see streaks of of reds and blacks and bluish colors um, in the soil, and that's called modeling. Um, and that's where the soil has. I'm not going to go into the chemistry behind it, but the soil has basically um, been saturated and then the water table has dropped and it's come up again and it's caused some of those um, some of the um, minerals in the soil um, to become soluble um, and start to leak out um, but not all the way um, and then the third characteristic is vegetation so um, you have to have uh, certain types of aquatic vegetation. So this is um, vegetation that is specifically adapted to growing in wet conditions. Um, so um, things like certain types of rushes and sedges, um, those are the common ones, um, but there, there are lots of different types of, of vegetation which can count towards being aquatic. Um, and there are different categories of vegetation too. So you've got, um, there's, there's a range. It goes from um, upland. So you've got completely upland plants. You're, you know, 99% of the time you find that plant, uh, it is not going to be in a wetland. Um, and then you've got sort of in the middle, which is uh, facultative, which is, means that sometimes it'll be considered a wet, you know, sometimes that land will be a wetland where it's found, sometimes it won't be. Um, and then on the other end, you've got obligate. Um, and what that means is if you find that plant, you know, 99% of the time, it's going to be a wetland. It's going to be in a wetland. Um, so you've got upland, facultative, and obligate. Those are sort of the three criteria. And I don't know if I talked about that. No, I didn't talk about that. Um, well, we've only got a few minutes left, um, so let me run through riparian buffers really quickly. Um, and again, if you have questions, you know, please continue to ask them. Um, so, one of the things that really makes a, a, health, a stream healthy um, has to do with the riparian buffers. So, the the trees that are growing on either side. Um, so, if it has, if there's a really good canopy of trees, they can um, moderate the the stream flow, they moderate the temperature of the water, um, they can add oxygen, they stabilize the banks, um, they, their leaves falling into the water become food for some of those macroinvertebrates that we talked about at the beginning, so they contribute to the aquatic food chain. Um, so they are really important. So as I said, a riparian buffer is a vegetated area um, that is right next to a stream and it protects the stream from anything that is running off the land. Um, so we're really interested in having riparian buffers these days because the riparian buffer will protect against um, pollution. So if you have uh, nutrients or sediments or bacteria even um, in a field um, and it runs off when it rains, um, when it gets to the riparian buffer, that buffer will soak up that water, it'll soak up those nutrients and, um, and the bacteria and it won't allow it to get into the stream. Um, so they're important for protecting uh, the water. Um, again, sort of mentioned these things. Um, one thing I didn't mention is, is they're really good um, wildlife food and habitat. Um, so these are often um, wildlife corridors. Um, so wildlife travels along the streams um, through these 
through these riparian buffers. Um, so it's, it's good habitat for wildlife as well. So if you don't have good tree canopy or good vegetation growing along the side of the stream, you can get things like this where you've got uh, a lot of erosion happening. Um, that soil is making is, is eroding into the stream and being carried farther downstream and, and causing issues farther downstream. Um, whereas if you had plants, uh, here's another uh, picture of uh, really bad erosion. Um, this is right along the, the Rappahannock. Um, and as you see, there's some trees here, but they're not a lot of trees. But if you had trees, um, the roots of the tree hold the soil in place, it'll stabilize it um, and allow other things to grow as well. Um, so, you know, grasses don't have very, um, very deep roots, at least a lot of the, the fescues, uh, that most of the grass that you see outside doesn't have really deep root systems. Um, so they're not gonna really grow a whole lot along the banks um, unless you've got other things to hold, to hold the soil in place. If you do have that, um, they can start to grow and, and take hold a little bit more. Um, if the soil isn't constantly getting washed away, um, then they won't be able to, um, you know, if, it, if it's getting constantly washed away, they can't grow very well. Um, okay, so it looks like we've got about 30 seconds left, so I'll stop and any final questions that you guys may have, I'm happy to answer um, really quick before we go. If not, I will post, um, certainly I will post the, um, that picture uh, into the, uh, on that page that you guys, that I sent to you guys. Okay. Yep. 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 That link. Um, and, and you can uh, hopefully... Thank you, Michael. This was very yep. informative. I think it was a, a really nice presentation. So uh, next up is the special topic. So we'll see you back in the breakout room. Thank you. Yep.